Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining today. Just about to get things going. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Deal with it. Uh, reviewing problem samples uh, with ICP OES. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, for the attendees unfamiliar with GoToWebinar, we've taken some screenshots of the attendee interface. There are two ways in which you may have entered the webinar, either by downloading the application or using the web interface. On the right is the web interface control panel. On the left is the desktop application interface. The desktop application is shown here. So to the left is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will view the presentation. You can maximize this to more easily view what is being presented. To the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can ask questions and select the audio mode. Note that the Control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click View uh, Menu and uncheck Auto Hide. Here's the web interface. For most of you, believe will be in the web interface. The presentation will be uh, shown in your browser window, and you'll have a web-based control panel on the, the right side of your browser. This is where you can ask questions, open handouts, and enter uh, full screen mode there at the bottom. Um, you'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. The web interface shown on the left and desktop application is shown on the right. So you can uh, send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and then address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Oh, uh, one other thing to hide and open the control panel for the desktop application, click on that orange button uh, with a white arrow. Now I would like to introduce you to Ken Neuber, our speaker for today. He's got a great headshot uh, professionally done, so that's great. Uh, thanks, Ken. <laughs> and he, so Ken is a, a senior application scientist at Perkin Elmer. He's been with us for over uh, 20 years, working in a variety of areas, primarily with ICP OES and ICP MS technologies. So without uh, further ado, I'll hand it over to Ken and uh, get the presentation going. Thanks for joining again. Thank you for the introduction, Aaron. Hello, my name is Ken Neubauer. I'm an application scientist with Perkin Elmer. Welcome to our webinar today on dealing with problem samples with ICP OES. I would like to thank everyone for attending this talk today. I'll be talking about how to overcome some challenges in ICP OES analyses. All of the examples I'll present today are challenges which were presented to us by our users. So let's start by talking about some of the challenges which must be overcome in ICP OES analysis. First, since ICP OES has a wide dynamic range, there are applications which require both high and low concentrations to be measured in the same sample with the same method. These concentrations can range from low part per billion to high part per million. In other applications, there is need to measure high concentrations, but very high precisions. RSDs of less than 0.2% are required. While ICP OES is easily capable of attaining RSDs under 1%, RSDs of less than 0.2% are challenging, but it is possible with the right method conditions. ICP OES can also handle samples with high levels of total dissolved solids much easier than other atomic spectroscopy techniques. However, measuring samples with 10% total dissolved solids and higher can be problematic. But with the correct choices of sample introduction and plasma conditions, it's possible to perform long-term stable analyses. Volatile and organic sample matrices provide a challenge due to the presence of carbon interferences and the challenge of maintaining a stable plasma. 
However, it's possible to overcome both of these issues as before with the correct choice of sample introduction, plasma, and method conditions. Finally, as with any technique, interferences are present, but there are ways to overcome them, which we will discuss. An example of measuring both high and low concentrations in the same sample is in the analysis of wine. Some analytes are typically present at less than 0.05 ppm, with cadmium typically being present at less than 0.01 ppm. However, minerals also have to be measured, and they are usually present at concentrations greater than 100 ppm, although potassium is usually present at 1000 ppm or greater. When measuring both high and low level analytes in the same sample, there are three solutions applied, which we'll look at in more detail. The first is wavelength selection. We want to select sensitive wavelengths for low level analytes and less sensitive wavelengths for analytes which are present higher concentrations. The second strategy is the plasma view. We'll use both axial and radial views in the same method. Finally, we'll use attenuation mode. This is something unique to the Avia 200, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail. With thousands of wavelengths available, there are plenty of wavelengths to choose from when doing analyses by ICP OES. The Avio 500 has over 6,000 wavelengths, while the Avio 200 has the ability to use any wavelength from 165 to 900 nanometers. Many elements have both sensitive and non-sensitive wavelengths. Shown here are the top four recommended wavelengths for cadmium on the Avio, although 53 cadmium wavelengths are available on the Avio 500 detector. As shown in this table, the top three wavelengths have high intensity while the fourth wavelength is, not, is much less sensitive. For the analysis of cadmium in wine, we use cadmium-114. Having the ability to view the plasma both axially and radially affects the sensitivity, as well as the level of spectral interferences. Axial view looks down through the top of the plasma along the length of the plasma, which provides a longer optical path, resulting in higher sensitivity. However, this also means that any interferences will also be more intense. Radial view looks across the plasma, this is a much shorter optical path, which results in lower sensitivity, but this is ideal for high analyte concentrations. A benefit of radial view is the lower signal from the interferences due to the shorter optical path. This often results in a higher signal to background ratio. Both radial and axial views are using the same method for the analyses of wines. The Avio 200 has the unique ability to run in attenuation mode, where the signal from selected wavelengths can be reduced without affecting the sensitivity of other wavelengths. The attenuation is applied before the light enters the spectrometer. Attenuation mode is especially important on the Avio 200, which has high sensitivity due to its optical design. We use attenuation mode for the analysis of wine. I won't show the results from the wine analysis yet, but I will later after I show how another strategy was applied to the wine analysis. To attain high precision for major elements, we use a technique called continuous real-time simultaneous internal standardization, known as Kurtzis. Some practical examples of where Kurtzis is used include the analysis to validate the composition of lithium ion battery materials during production, measuring major components in alloys, during precious metal reclaim from electronics recycling, and monitoring the concentration of major components in plating baths. Kurtzis can't be applied to any application which requires accurate, high precision results for major or matrix components, where it is important to determine the exact composition or concentration. Kurtzis takes advantage of the true simultaneous nature of the Avio 500. Let's take a look at Kurtzis in more detail. The key to Kurtzis is to measure the analyte and internal standard at exactly the same time, which means that their read and integration times must be identical. With identical read and integration times, any variations in the analyte signal will also affect the internal standard. This means the internal standard will compensate for any variations to the analyte in real time. This is the key to obtaining high precision. Another important factor for Kurtzis is that the internal standard must behave exactly the same as the analyte. This may mean using non-traditional internal standards, matching atom to atom lines or ion to ion lines, and or using non-traditional analyte lines. In addition, the internal standard concentration should be adjusted to provide a similar intensity as the analyte. Let's take a look at how Kurtzis is set up in a practical application. Kurtzis is most easily done with manual integration, which is set in the method. To get an idea of what integration times to use, the sample can first be run with auto integration. Then the auto integration report can be viewed to see what integration and read times were applied to which analytes. This is a good, good starting point. When developing a Kurtzis method, it is a good idea to start by selecting multiple wavelengths per element. As shown in this example from one of my co-workers in Shanghai, 
or the determination of nickel, cobalt, and manganese in the production of a lithium ion battery material. In this case, the ratio of nickel to cobalt to manganese affects the performance of the battery. Therefore, it is very important to obtain accurate, precise values for these elements. In this example, four to five different wavelengths were used for each analyte. The less intense wavelengths have integration times of 0.2 seconds, while the more intense wavelengths have an integration time of 0.01 seconds. You'll also notice that there are three different wavelengths selected for yttrium, the internal standard. The yttrium integration time must match those of the analytes so that they're measured at exactly the same time. In this example, yttrium-371 has an integration time of 0.01 seconds, so it will be paired with the analytes that have this integration time, cobalt-228 and all of the manganese lines. Likewise, yttrium-324 has an integration time of 0.2 seconds, so it will be paired with the analytes that use this integration time, all of the nickel lines and most of the cobalt lines. Finally, the read time equals 5 seconds. The longer the read time, the lower the RSDs because any noise will be averaged out over time. However, in this case, 5 seconds gave acceptable result. Here we see the RSDs for nickel, cobalt, and manganese from four different samples of lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide using the method from the previous slide. Each sample is run in duplicate and each sample is represented by a different color bar. These results show that all the RSDs are less than 0.15%, with most wavelengths having RSDs less than 0.1%, demonstrating that Kurtzis is capable of providing results with very high precisions. The analyte concentrations are shown on this slide and represent the concentrations in solution after sample preparation. All samples fell within the same general range, from about 20 ppm for cobalt up to about 65 ppm for nickel. The customer is happy with these results and has implemented this methodology. ICP OES has the ability to easily handle high levels of total dissolved solids, up to percent levels. But as concentrations increase, certain standard operating conditions must be changed to ensure quality data. An example of a high solid sample is brine. While there are many different types of brines, the most common is sodium chloride, used in the production of chlorine gas. These brines are generally 20 to 30 percent sodium chloride and are most commonly analyzed with the 2x dilution, meaning that 10 to 15 percent total dissolved solids are entering the instrument. The solution to handling these concentrations are choosing the appropriate sample introduction components and plasma When analyzing high TDS samples, it's important to use a nebulizer specially designed for high solids to limit clogging. In addition, reducing the sampling uptake rate also helps. Most ICP OES analyses are run with sample uptake rates of 1 to 1.5 mils a minute, but going to lower flows at about 0.5 mils a minute will often result in higher singular background ratios in high TDS samples. An argon humidifier is also important to acquiring steady, consistent results with high TDS samples. The nebulizer gas flow is humidified prior to introduction to the nebulizer. The wet argon continuously rinses the nebulizer tip to present deposition in the buildup of solids. Likewise, it also flushes the inside of the injector tip, limiting nucleation sites to prevent deposition and clogging. The choice of injector will also help with stability and reproducibility. A sapphire injector with a 2.0 mm ID gives the best stability and robustness. Sapphire injectors are much smoother on the inside than injectors made from other materials. This will reduce nucleation sites, minimizing the chance for solids to deposit and cause problems. The choice of plasma conditions is also very important when analyzing samples with high levels of dissolved solids. A high RF power is better able to handle the matrices, a burn up more of the matrix leading to less suppression. In addition, a plasma flow of 10 to 12 liters per minute will provide better stability with high levels of dissolved solids. Increasing the auxiliary flow a bit will move the base of the plasma away from the injector tip, reducing the chances of matrix deposition on the injector, which could cause clogging. Finally, Using reduced nebulizer flow puts less sample into the plasma. The main benefit is that there will be much less matrix suppression, leading to increased signal to background ratios. This is a picture from one of my coworkers in the Netherlands who was running a sodium chloride brine on an avio. By implementing these conditions, we can achieve excellent stability in high matrix samples. In these examples, we spike 10 and 15% sodium chloride solutions with 50 parts per billion of the analytes listed and we measure them for four hours with a two-minute rinse between samples. The intensities were normalized to the first reading, and we could see that the stability is better than 6% in both the 10 and 15% sodium chloride brines. 
The elements for this test were chosen because they are the most important when analyzing sodium chloride brines using the production of chlorine gas via electrolysis with the polymeric membrane process. Since these elements poison the membrane, their concentrations must be monitored to determine when the membrane must be changed. Another challenge for ICP OES is the analysis of volatile and organic samples. Two practical examples are the analysis of used oils and wine. Oil analysis is done by diluting it 10x in kerosene following ASTM method D5185. While wines can have an additional ethanol content from 10 to 18 percent plus other organic components. In both of these examples, the challenges posed by the organics can be overcome by using the correct plasma conditions and sample introduction choices. Let's look at the analysis of in-service oils in more detail. The challenge is that these are pure organic samples. The oils are diluted in kerosene or VSOV for analysis. The problems to overcome are carbon buildup on the injector, torch, and spectrometer entrance window, maintaining a stable signal, the high viscosity of the samples, and the high carbon background. Let's look at how each of these challenges are addressed. The first challenge is the high carbon level. The avios use plasma shear, a thin flow of air perpendicular to the plasma, which cuts off the end of the plasma. As a result, there is no deposition on the interface window. For the analysis, a robust plasma is used, 1500 watts. In addition, the auxiliary flow is increased to push the base of the plasma away from the injector, preventing carbon deposition. A three-slot torch is used for this analysis. This torch was designed specifically for organic samples to limit carbon deposition on the torch. This results in longer torch lifetimes. The next challenge with oil samples is their viscosity. The vertical torch handles high viscosity samples very well because any non-ionized droplets will drain into the spray chamber and be pumped away rather than depositing on the torch or injector. In addition, because non-ionized samples don't collect on the torch, the torch lifetime will be extended. Of course, if the in order to get the sample to the torch, a nebulizer capable of handling high viscosity samples is required. The Gemco nebulizer easily handles high viscosity samples. The sample passes through a very wide channel, then transverses the face of the nebulizer where it intersects an argon stream which aerosolizes it. The wide channel is very resistant to clogging, which is perfect for in-service oil samples which can have solids in them. The next challenge to deal with with oil analysis is the high carbon background. There are two solutions here, measure in radial mode and correct for any interferences. As discussed earlier, measuring in radio mode lowers the background from the carbon. The end-light sensitivity also decreases, but the signal-to-background ratio improves compared to axial mode, meaning that lower concentrations can be measured. Residual interferences from carbon can be overcome with the use of multi-component spectral fitting, or MSF, which is usually applied to sodium and potassium in in-service oil samples. We'll look at MSF in more detail later. The challenge with wine analysis is the volatility of the samples, which contain ethanol as well as other organic components. Since ethanol has a boiling point of 78 degrees Celsius, its volatility creates a few problems. First, we have to worry about keeping the plasma lit. Then we also have to worry about maintaining a stable signal. And like the oils, there's going to be a high carbon balance. The solutions are to use a lower sample uptake rate than normal, a narrow bore injector, a low nebulizer flow, high RF power, and increased plasma flow and using radial view for the analysis. The low sample uptake rate and narrowbore injector decrease the amount of sample entering in the plasma, which helps increase stability and minimize matrix suppression. In addition, the higher RF power and increased plasma flow also increase stability and minimize matrix suppression. The low flow nebulizer is optimized for low sample uptake rates to help maintain sensitivity. Using a radial plasma view lowers the carbon background, meaning that fewer carbon interferences are present. All these changes will ultimately result in a higher signal background ratio, allowing lower concentrations to be measured. Another option is to use a chilled spray chamber, which will also decrease plasma loading, but chilled spray, spray chamber was not used in the wine analysis. Here are the results of the wine analysis. We purchased four wines locally, ranging from light to dark in color, a Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, Rosé, and Pinot Noir. The different color bars represent each of the wine samples. As results show, there is a wide range of analyte concentrations measured in the wines, from less than 0.001 ppm for cadmium up to 1,000 ppm for potassium, with silver not being detected in any of the wines. The elemental concentrations were surprisingly similar between the wines, with the exception of arsenic, 
which range from not detecting the rosé up to 0.01 ppm in the Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay. Copper was also higher in the Pinot Noir than in the other wines. To assess the accuracy of the methodology, all wines are spiked with low analyte concentrations relative to the analyte concentrations measured. Calcium, magnesium, and potassium were not spiked at lower levels due to their high analyte concentrations in the wines. The spike level ranged from 0.03 ppm for cadmium up to 50 ppm for sodium. All recoveries for all the wines are within 10%, demonstrating the accuracy of the methodology. The accuracy at higher concentrations also had to be verified. Therefore, all elements were spiked at higher levels, ranging from 0.1 ppm up to 1,000 ppm for potassium. Again, all recoveries and all the wines were within 10%. By adjusting sample introduction and plasma conditions, both low and high concentrations could be accurately measured in the wine samples, overcoming the challenges posed by the presence of ethanol. Another challenge which appears in all atomic spectroscopy techniques is the presence of interferences. We'll show two practical examples, the determination of phosphorus and nickel alloy, and the analysis of pharmaceutical products with USP chapters 232 and 233. The solutions employed, selecting different non-interfered with wavelengths, using radio plasma view, and correcting for the interferences. The easiest way to remove the effects of an interference is to select a different non-interfered wavelength for the analysis. However, this may not always be possible, as alternative wavelengths may have interferences or may not have enough sensitivity. But this should be the first option explored. In this example, we had to measure phosphorus and nickel alloy. This was an issue presented to one of my coworkers in China. We took the composition of the alloy after it had been digested and prepared for analysis and made single element solutions of each component, as seen in this box. We had to measure phosphorus at 0.1 ppm so we prepared that also. We then ran each solution individually while monitoring four different phosphorus wavelengths in radio mode. After running all solutions, we overlaid all the spectra. The spectra on the left will represent phosphorus 214. As we can see, the phosphorus signal is very small and there are direct overlaps from molybdenum and tungsten, meaning that 214 is not a good wavelength to analyze phosphorus in this nickel matrix. However, if we look at phosphorus 178, we see a very strong phosphorus peak and a very low background, meaning that we have no interferences. So in this case, we used phosphorus 178 for the analysis. When we sent these results back to Shanghai, our colleague reproduced them and did a quantitative test and was able to recover the 0.1 ppm spike within 10%. This methodology was then implemented at the customer site. When alternative wavelengths are not available, software-based interference corrections can be used. Inter-element equation corrections, known as IECs, work by running standards of interfering species and monitoring the analytes to determine the apparent concentrations caused by the interferences. IEC models can be built inside Synjistix. Another interference correction technique is multi-component spectral fitting, or MSF. This involves running a blank, an analyte standard, and an interference standard, and building an MSF model within Synjistix. Let's look a little bit closer at how MSF works and how it's applied to a practical example. When analyzing pharmaceutical products following USP method 232 and 233, 23 elements are specified, and their concentrations are based on their J values. We won't go into the J values here, but it's important to evaluate for potential interferences by running single element standards for each analyte and looking at the spectra. Let's look at an example based on the concentrations in the 1.5J value of this table. When a multi-element calibration standard is run and arsenic-193 is monitored, this is the resulting spectrum, which we see for arsenic-193. A peak appears near where the arsenic-193 peak is expected, but we don't know if this is really arsenic. Could it be a slight peak shift, or is there an interference? To find out, we have to run individual single element standards. When we run the single element standards and overlay them with the spectrum of the multi-element standard, we see that what we thought was the peak for arsenic is really due to chromium, with a slight contribution from platinum. When we run the arsenic standard by itself, we see that it appears we're expected. However, the arsenic peak is completely obscured by the shoulder from the chromium peak. However, we can remove this interference by using MSF, 
let's take a look at how an MSF model is set up in the software. Building an MSF model in Synergistics is simple. We first run single element standards of our blank, our analyte, and our interferences. In this case, our blank is 3% nitric and 3% hydrochloric acids. Our analyte is 0.45 ppm arsenic, and our interferences are chromium at 220 ppm and platinum at 3 ppm. We then overlay all the spectra, and then we assign each spectrum. Our acids are assigned a blank, arsenic is assigned an analyte, and then our platinum and our chromium are assigned as interferences. We then save this model and apply it to the method. After the MSF model is applied, the effects of the interferences are removed. We can see this by looking at these two spectra. First, we ran the multi-element standard, and we do not load the MSF model into the method, and the blue spectrum is what results. We then took the same data, the same method, added the MSF model, and reprocessed it. And as we can see, the effect of the interference is removed, and the arsenic peak is clearly seen. This is the spectrum which is used for the calculations within Synergistics. As we have seen, challenging samples are interesting. These challenges result from interferences, volatility, organic matrices, having a wide analyte concentration range in the sample, and the requirements of high precision. In most cases, there are ways to deal with and overcome these challenges by using different sample introduction components and conditions, changing the plasma conditions, implementing software corrections, and changing method parameters. The best way to overcome many of these challenges encountered with ICP OES is to run things just a bit differently than normal. Results. I'd like to thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, I guess it's, uh, it's time for question and answer period of uh, the presentation. Thank you, Ken, that was uh, really good. Um, yeah, so to, to, to submit uh, further questions, uh, just use uh, the questions pane in the, the control panel here. And, uh, and uh, Ken is now able to, uh, to respond to them. So let's uh, get to them here. I always get the certificate question in there. That's a question uh, commonly asked uh, regarding uh, attendance certificates. You get attendance certificate uh, in the email following about 24 hours after this presentation. All right, so here's the new one. So are there any special sample introduction conditions required for the metallurgical work, like the nickel alloy example you showed, Ken? Um, in that case, there weren't. We used just the standard nebulizer, spray chamber, and injector that came with, in that case, we were using an Avio 200. Um, in certain cases, depending what the matrix is dissolved in, maybe you would have to do something special. But uh, I've run some metallurgical samples that have been dissolved in up to 40% acid. And the only thing we did then was we increased the plasma flow to make the torch a little more stable and extend the torch lifetime a little bit. But generally, when running metallurgical, it's just going to be a high level of dissolved solids, so you don't need to do anything too special. And generally, it's going to be around 1% to 2% dissolved solids. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ken. That's good. Uh, so standard sample and true, basically. Um, I have uh, another question. Is Kurtzis only available on the Avio 500? That's a good question. Um, in this case, yes, it is because it requires two true simultaneous analysis. So since the Avio 200 looks at one analyte at a time, you cannot do Kurtzis at it. You can still get precise measurements, but not near the precision that you can get with the Avio 500. Just because on the Avio 500, we're measuring the internal standard and the analyte at exactly the same time. Yeah. While on the Avio 200, we measure the analyte first than the internal standard. So they two be and there's the two detectors on the 500, right? So we can exactly. Have, exactly. have a lot of options there. Um, I had a question. That's a good question. What is J value? <laughs> the J value is something that's put, put forward by U.S. Pharmacopeia in 
USP methods 232, 233. And it deals with the concentration. This way to determine the concentration of your analytes for a particular pharmaceutical or drug product. It's based on the maximum daily dose, um, which is also dependent on the uh, root right administration, right. Yeah. whether it's oral, parenteral, or in inhaled. It's depending on the sample prep, how much the sample is diluted. And also, there's a third thing too, I can't remember offhand. But it's dependent on a bunch it's of different, the, different things. The, the, the dosage, the route of administration, and That's your right, preparation, dosage. basically yeah. your preparation factor. Right. 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 It's factored into that value. So it's a maximum uh, limit for that elemental impurity based on how you're prepared, the type of drug, and how you're preparing it. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I didn't really explain it in this one. Um, Another question, what would you do for analytes measured that would only have applicable wavelengths that end up appearing as interferences for each other? Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> so they so interesting. interfere on each other, I guess is the question, yeah. So that's, for example, I guess, like, for example, if we're looking at copper and phosphorus, and we have to use the 214 line, for example, for both of them. Uh, in that case, if depending how much the overlap you can set your peak we you determine your points per peak you could kind of move them off the top of the peak so maybe you're looking at the side of the peak where it won't there won't be an interference from the other peak i've done that a couple times um, you could use inner element correction equations those tend to work mm -hmm. also although it'd be a little it still could be challenging if you have your interfering analyte interfering with each other though I guess it really depends on the extent of the overlap. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, you, you, those are good examples. You can use IEC, you could use uh, off-peak integration. Uh, there's a couple of different approaches. I mean, we there's a lot of wavelengths out there. We could try and find a, another one. But yeah, if you if you really had to, um, I'd say IECs. If or, or you could have different MSF models. Again, it depends on the overlap. Yeah, it's a good question. We'd need a kind of example situation, probably. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay. Um, someone asked, uh, they missed a few slides. Yeah, you, they, we will get, send out a, a link to this presentation after the uh, after this call. Um, this is a good question. Can you provide information on samples prepared with high concentrates of lithium borates, just fused beads? Ooh, I've never done those. We do have an application note about looking at lithium borate samples or, di or different types of fusion samples. In that case, what we've done, we've generally used a argon humidifier because it could be a very high solid. So we want to keep things from depositing. And because those types of samples can be very corrosive, we tend to also use a ceramic torch. Because even if you're using a high a high flow of, for your plasma, you're still, those samples are so corrosive, they're still going to eat away uh, quartz torches relatively fast. So it's we've gone to use a ceramic torch with those. Yeah, good point. The really high salt content samples, fusions, the ceramic torches really uh, are, are really nice. They save you from having to do extra maintenance and torch replacements. When yeah, I did the brine work, um, what I would do is at the end of each day, I would take the torch out and I would soak it just to clean it, to try to prevent buildup over time to extend the torch lifetime. That's another option which works. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, we do have an app note on lithium borate um, Fusions, um, work. Yeah. So if, if you, if you want to, uh, if you want to reach out, uh, you know, after I can, I can give you a link to that. Um, I'm just going through. How, this is an interesting one. How do you handle interferences related to uranium analysis? I mean, uranium probably has a lot of emission lines. Uh, I'm guessing they, they mean testing samples that are high uranium or samples for low uranium. Uh, I didn't know, you know, which doesn't really specify. Yeah, I guess I'm I've never done that, so I can't con. I can't um, talk about that specifically, but I guess I would do those same strategies. I would run uranium, just a single emit uranium standard, and then run, look at your other analytes in your method, 
and see where the interferences are, what you can do with them. Another option, if you have an IV of 500, is to use the universal data acquisition. Because what that will do is it'll let you add just about any, any element that you want, or any wavelength that you want. So say you're seeing uranium interference on, I don't know, making, I'm just making something up, cadmium. You could then run UDA and put all, you know, all 53 cadmium lines in, for example, reprocess and see where, which ones uranium will interfere with and which ones it will not. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yeah, I've done, I've done some high uranium uh, work. I mean, yeah, uranium, big yeah, element, a lot of uh, electron transitions, right? A lot of emission lines. So I find, um, you know, just the, the typical approaches like, uh, like Ken says here, just run the sample, look at your analytes and just see where those spectral overlaps are from the, uh, from the high concentration of whatever's in that sample and uh, try to mitigate it as much as possible through selection of uh, alternate wavelengths, IEC or MSF sort of correction. One thing that's really helped me when I started doing, doing ICP OES is using single element standards. I use them Correct. a lot. So yeah. again, if I think there's going to be an interference from a matrix, I'll use, say it's going to be a uranium matrix. I'll run a thousand ppm uranium by itself, see where it's going to interfere. And again, if it, it interferes on cadmium, for example, then I'll run several single element cadmium standards and overlay the, the spectra of both. So yeah. it's just single element standards are, are your, a great way to diagnose problems, diagnose interferences, and how to come up with solutions to them. I completely agree. Yeah, for sure. For ISPO, yes, there's definitely... You want uh, single elements for all your interference, especially. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's a few questions here. I'm just kind of going through them, kind of answer them. Um, question. Where do I find application notes? Uh, application notes can be found on, online on Perkin Elmer's uh, website. Um, there's some. There's some links that will be through this. I'll, I'll send some links uh, in the follow-up email. And uh, there's the handouts I, I've put here. So there's a few handouts on some of the applications. There. But um, you know, feel free to reach out if you if you need uh, sources of information. Looking for links, it's sometimes hard to find them properly. Um, how much do argon humidifiers cost? Uh, uh, they don't cost up much actually it's a pretty simple device um i think they're around a thousand dollars uh i'm not too sure i, I haven't looked at actual price in a little bit on those but around a thousand dollars or so depending on the uh, model um so i had someone say when running samples that have high tds we often deal with the plasma extinguishing Due to droplets developing our injector tip, any suggestions or further comments on optimization to prevent this? Yeah, um, a couple things. First, again, an argon humidifier will definitely help. Um, the other thing that will be good is sometimes if you put a little more, a little longer rinse between samples, what that will do is it'll help clean the tip a little more. Another thing, which again I learned from one of my coworkers over in the Netherlands, he said a sapphire injector. He finds that works very well for high dissolved solid samples. Because the in, the interior of a sapphire injector, he says, could be smoother, there's less nucleation sites. And when I've switched to that, I have seen um, I have seen it work much better than a typical alumina injector, for example. So that's an option also. Yeah, yep, yeah, the sapphire quartz uh, injectors do. The other, thing, the other thing you could do is sometimes if you increase the auxiliary flow a little bit from maybe 0.2 to 0.3, that will move the base of the plasma away from the injector, and so you'll get less deposition coming out of the plasma onto the injector. So 0 0.3, 0 0.4 sometimes for the um, auxiliary flow. Yeah, that's a good point. It does help. Um, I had one comment: uh, the testing, uh, you know, phosphorus in oil, and it tends to be on the lower in the sample tubes, I guess. He's essentially, the, the question is, what uh, are some possible advances in auto samplers to homogenize samples? Um, well, for, for oil analysis, there is, a, there is an auto sampler that we typically recommend that just prior to analysis, there's a stir. It goes in and it stirs the sample up, mix the, the oil sample up, 
and then then the probe comes along and samples it right after that. So it, it definitely helps. It, it the homogenization is is key when running organics and especially you know oils and lubricants and especially when they're suspended solid you know little uh, wear metals and so forth in the in the oil. So yeah, it's definitely uh, good to have a, a mixing auto sampler for those sample types. Um, so this, uh, this customer says, uh, our lab has an Avia 200, but I never use MSF. Can I get the detailed operating manual or document of MSF? Yeah, so I can, uh, we can send you a link to some of that. It's actually in the help menu. So if you, if you go into the examine window and, and go into MSF mode and hit F1, It'll bring you into the help menu, and it actually does have a little bit of a description there on that. In addition, uh, I know coming up in a few weeks, uh, if to double check what the date is, we have a, a talk that goes into more detail on MSF. So we will have a, a webinar specifically uh, kind of on that, uh, a little more detail on metallurgical application um, and, and how MSF was used. So, just a good question. Ken, uh, anything? I think that. No, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I'd say the help menu is a pretty good tutorial on it. And I kind of, in this project, I try to outline the steps. I mean, it's brief, but that's basically all there is to it. You run your single, your single element interference, single element matrix, and your single element, or your blank. You then go into the examine window, and then there's the drop down menu on the far left corner. You select MSF and then you make your assignments. Once you save the model, then you go file save, save the model. Then when you go into the method, I believe it's the processing page, you go, you select uh, how you want to process MSF, IEC, or none. And then you select which analytes you put it to. So again, it's difficult to describe the details without looking at the software. But again, there there is information that helps out describes all this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there definitely is, uh, and and your local application scientist could probably help you as well. And if you know if you have questions, they usually could uh, help you with that. Um, uh, uh, oh yeah, here here it is. Uh, here it is. October fourteenth is the uh, the next uh, is the next one, and it's demystifying SPOA spectral correction models. Uh, and, and essentially it goes over the you know creation of IECs and MSF just as you're asking for. So you know, please uh, please join us uh, on that one for for MSF and IEC explanations a little more in a little more depth. Um, so a few more questions here. I'm just kind of going through them. Um, to provide information. Okay, we talked about that, talked about that. Oh, so here's a question. How did you know exact concentration of the elements causing interference in the arsenic, arsenic analysis? Okay, what that was for us is when we were doing the USP work, they specify the, con or you have to run the 23 elements that are specified. And then when you calculate the J values, they say the, cal the calibrations have to be 0.5J and 1.5J, and then you have to read back J, J concentration as part of the QC. So what I did is I took the, the single element standards, all of them that were present at the 1.5J value, because I figured those would be the highest. If, those are, if there are going to be interferences, there'll be interferences up there. And that's why I ran the single elements to see what was going on. It was actually a funny story. I didn't when I was first doing this. I did not run the single elements. I ran, you know, the the mixed the mixed mode standard, the mixed element standard. And I was in the lab, and one of my coworkers came by. He's like, "What? What are you looking at there?" I'm like, "That's arsenic." He's like, "No, it's not." I'm like, really? He's like, "No, that's not how it looks." So that's when I started running the single element standards and found out, you know, it definitely wasn't arsenic. It was definitely chromium I was seeing. So that was kind of a lesson for me to learn. Always, whenever there's a possibility of interferences and you know what they are, always run the single element standards at, at the high concentrations in which you'll be looking at. Just try to find out if there are any interferences present on your analytes. That's kind of how we did also with the uh, that phosphorus work when we did the phosphorus in the uh, nickel alloy. Same type of thing. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah, and then you can use, I, mean, I think the question is also asking, how do you know the concentration of the interferent 
uh, essentially. Well, you just have a single right. element standard of the interference and can that, right? Run it. Right. Run it in yeah, a similar so, concentration as a single element. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, that we had a question. What are the best parameters for the auxiliary RF and ne nebulizer when dealing with oil samples to prevent plasma from extinguishing? I find, I mean, that's like, it, it depends on the model of the instrument, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, yep. it depends on the model yep. and the, the torch, the nebulizer, um, usually high power. So usually you want to run them at uh, a high, uh, highest power of the RF generator, usually like 1500 watts or so. Um, any other comments there, Ken? Yeah, you want to make sure, again, for especially when you're doing these oils, you want to make sure the base of the plasma is away from the tip of the injector. You also want to look at where the the carbon, carbon bullet in the center of the plasma is located. You want that to be just below the top of the flat plate. Uh, so again, these, these conditions change slightly instrument to instrument. So I think you're running generally aux flows, you know, generally around 0.4, between 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. Neb flows, again, you're moving, that'll move where the carbon bullet is. And again, those will be generally higher than we normally use. So instead of 0.7, maybe up around 0.8. But again, with those, with these, it's more a visual thing. You have to look, each individual instrument be slightly different. So it's always good to run them and just observe and adjust and make the adjustments based on the observation of how yeah. the plasma looks when you're, after, when you're analyzing or aspirating the... When the organic, yeah. Yeah, when there's organics being yeah, aspirated into the system, right? You look in the plasma, you can see, uh, you know, the organics in the plasma. It's pretty, pretty obvious. So they can uh, definitely uh, be able to look at it and make sure it's off the the base there. Um, oh, this is a good question. I, I get this question once in a while, uh, in kind of f formed different ways. But uh, you know, is it Better to use a pure standard as the interference and the unknown sample for that. I'm assuming the the question is based on should I use a pure standard like that you purchase or uh, the reference, the unknown sample that's like a pure, usually they're your pure metals or inorganic, you know, compounds uh, of some sort and, and use that as a as an interference reference for the MSF model. Uh, I, I, I prefer I prefer pure standards personally. Sometimes I know, yeah, you know, like if you have a pure metal, it's it's tough to get you know pure. Also, get a pure single element standard that's high enough, right? Um, yeah. The other thing is when you get a pure when you get a single element standard, you get a certificate of analysis that comes with it, so you can see the concentrations of any contaminants in there. True. Well, if you say you're using a pure metal standard, it may be five nines pure, but you don't know what the other stuff is in there. That's why you're actually analyzing it, try to figure out what's in there. So I always think it's good to go with the pure standard where you have True. certificate of analysis. True, good point. Yeah. At least you have a certificate analysis to refer to if you see hey, why is that got contamination? You can check the C of A and if they also had contamination, you you can, you know, rule that out as an interference, potentially. Um so yeah, I, I I prefer singles, and sometimes for some of these sample types, a thousand won't cut it, right? You need to go buy a ten thousand, and yep. maybe uh, even sometimes I've bought higher personally, and then I dilute it into the matrix as well. Uh, sometimes it, it, you know if there's you know matrix effects or something like that um, that are associated with the sample uh, preparation or type. Um, so yeah, so you. you if you can source a you know a, a material that has a certificate of analysis that acts as a good reference for you uh, for your interference, uh, that's the best way for sure for OES. Um, other questions here. Um, here's a question. I am pipetting internal standards into all my samples. We have a T to pull from both, but I've never gotten it to be consistent. Is there a trick to getting that to work better? Um, <laughs> mm, well, if your T is pulling from both, that's probably not, I'm assuming you're pumping into your T, not like T's on the other side of the pump. Um, it's, it's 
consistency of that depends well on the T. Depends on your tubing diameters, right? Um, it'll depend on your matrices, what you're trying to dilute as well. That'll be a variable. And there are, there are different T's out there, so different geometries, which make a difference. Yeah. Um, one option one option I've heard also, which people some people use, instead of at piping the internal standard or adding it online as a T, if all the samples are being diluted the same amount, they'll add the internal standard to the diluent. So if every sample is going to be diluted 10x, the same amount of diluent will be added to each sample. So the same amount of internal standard will be added to each sample. And that's another way of doing it, which gets around some of these problems. Yep, that, that helps if you're doing this a consistent dilution for right. sure. Right. Yeah. And that's what we do with oils, right? We do yep. that with oils. Our yep. oil exactly. diluent has our internal standard, and all the oils are diluted at the same dilution factor. Therefore, the you know internal standard is the same in all the, the oil samples. Sure. All right. Um, I think we're getting close to the. Uh, you know, it's a few minutes left in the hour, but uh, I think we've got through all the questions. So thank you again, Ken. That was really good. Uh, just remember, everyone can download handouts uh, uh, now. Uh, you'll also get an email, follow-up email with link to this presentation. Um, remember, in, in two weeks, uh, we have this more detailed look into spectral correction models, both IEC and MSF, uh, and get into you know, the, the workflows for that. And uh, to locate all the webinars in this series, please you know visit this link. I'll, I'll make sure it's in the email that's sent to you following uh, this webinar, so, you, so you'll have uh, that link. You don't need to write it down. And then thank you, Ken, for your time and putting this uh, together, and thank everyone uh, else for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're here to help and. Uh, and once you leave today's webinar, just to uh, let you know that you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you complete that and provide your feedback. As I said, you will receive a follow-up email in about 24 hours from now with a link to this uh, recording uh, for this webinar. So on behalf of Perk and Elmer and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.